This is Duke University. I'm going to talk about uh, mostly about IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I realized that the first word in the title of my talk is process, and I was just telling Lydia that it's a sign of mental decay if you think that uh, pr process issues are actually interesting, but actually I, I do think that some of the IPCC process stuff is slightly interesting. Um, so I'll talk about that, but before I get into IPCC, I will mention uh, my new job, Woods Hole Research Center. Just so you know what it is, uh, it's an independent uh, nonprofit research center. Uh, it focuses technically mainly on uh, what we call the land climate connection, uh, uh, specifically issues of terrestrial carbon cycle forest management. Uh, they do a lot of work in uh, the really hot button areas, which are the tropics uh, and the Arctic. Uh, the Woods Hole Research Center is celebrating its 30th birthday this year. It was founded by a fellow named George Woodwell, uh, uh, who is still around and ran it himself uh, for many years. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm here today is to talk to folks here about possible collaborations. Woods Hole Research Center is a very science-focused uh, institution. We do, however, want to do work that's policy-relevant. Uh, and it would be helpful to us to have collaborators who can extend the science work that we do into the realm of economics or, or policy analysis, and it would also be helpful to us, and it's always helpful uh, to work with folks who can help us to get the work, to bring it to actually bring it to the attention uh, of policymakers. So I hope to talk to some of you later today uh, about that. And the bottom panel here is one of the things that the Woods Hole Research Center was known for. That's a pan-tropical carbon map. Uh, it's a map of above-ground carbon stocks. And I know there's folks here who do things like that as well. Those maps are produced using a combination of remote sensing, uh, in-situ measurements, and statistical modeling. OK, so let's talk about the IPCC. Um, and what I'm going to do is talk about, really, the fifth assessment report, which has been released in stages. The first volume was released uh, in September 2013. The latest, the last volume out of four, will actually be released on November 1st or October 31st in Copenhagen. I will be leaving next week to spend a week negotiating the final text of the summary of that. Um, and so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about how the IPCC process works and how it influenced that process, the nature of that process influences the content and then I'm going to talk about some of the findings in the fifth assessment report. And I'm not going to try to give a comprehensive tour, uh, but what I'm going to do is focus on things that I think are new or interesting or in some way uh, noteworthy. So as far as just basic stuff on IPCC, I'm sure all of you know this IPCC was established in 1988. Uh, it has, it's, it's an arm of the United Nations. Uh, there's 195 or so, plus or minus, uh, member nations. The main thing the IPCC does is it produces these assessment reports, and I was just mentioning the fifth assessment report. The first assessment report came out in 1990. Uh, the assessment reports come out at, at five or six or seven year intervals, and as I said, the latest one is being released. This one is actually being released in stages over a period of about a year. Okay. Um, the IPCC has three so-called working groups. Uh, the so-called working group one focuses on physical science stuff, drivers of climate change, observations of climate change, how do we interpret those observations using physical models to project future climate. Uh, working group two focuses on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. That includes it, looking at issues of how do these changes in the physical system impact things that we care about, like human health and water scarcity, and so on. It also discusses uh, the whole idea of adaptation measures that we can take to reduce not climate change itself, but some of the, some of the impacts of climate change. And the third working group, uh, which is the most foreign to me, is about mitigation. And it's really very, very focused on the economics of climate change. And, and a lot of it is, most of it, I would say, is based on the so-called integrated assessment models, which are fundamentally economic models. Uh, but they also do integrate in some simple treatments of physical climate system. Um, so the mandate of the IPCC is to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. 
That is, the idea is IPCC produces information that is useful to policymakers as and informs policy, but we don't say you should do this or you should do that. Uh, so it's not policy prescriptive. I will talk in a bit about the review and approval processes, but you know, the, I, the big message, and I'll explain my perspective on this in a minute, but the, you know, one of the things I've learned over the last several years, or I knew already, but my involvement in, I think, my recent involvement in IPCC, which as I'll explain is as through the government side, uh, the big message that that drove home to me is that uh, the, the exhaustive nature, and I do mean exhaustive, of nature of the review and approval processes uh, are actually important because they do really do two things, and one is they make the reports authoritative. Okay, I, well let me just show you how the let me just show you how the review process works. The the other thing is that having extensive review and in some cases a, a requirement of unanimity uh, before statements are included, uh, a natural consequence of that process is you actually get very cautious statements. Okay. And that's important to keep in mind because a lot of the critics of the IPCC describe it as alarmist and so on, but the, the truth is the exact opposite. The truth is that the, the IPCC is extremely cautious, and that, that tendency towards caution <coughs> is a direct result of the processes that I'm about to describe. Okay. Um, so IPCC, these volumes that I've described, in each of those volumes, if you've never seen one, each of those volumes is a phone book. Okay. It's like 102,000 pages. Right? It's massive and it's technically dense. Okay? And these things go through drafts and there's a so-called first order draft and a second order draft and there's actually subsequent drafts. And those drafts are subject to two actual independent review processes and one is the so-called expert review process. And I'm using the phrase so-called expert because uh, for the most part uh, anyone can declare themselves to be uh, an expert and sign up as an expert reviewer. Some people tout that as if it's some sort of a credential, it really is. Uh, so the, the so-called expert review, and, and most, of the, most of the reviewers, the expert reviewers, really are experts, but not all of them are. Uh, it's in some sense an expert review, and maybe you could also describe it possibly as a public comment. Uh, but these volumes get tens of thousands of comments from the so-called experts. Uh, after the first order draft, there's another re independent review process, which is the, the government review process. And my involvement recently in IPCC, besides being a review editor on Working Group 2, is when I was leaving uh, the White House for the first, when I finished my first White House assignment in 2012, folks in the White House and folks in the State Department asked me if I would help to coordinate uh, the U.S. government review of the entire uh, Fifth Assessment Report. And that's a fairly monumental undertaking to give you, well, that <clears throat> numbers of comments that we produce gives you a sense of the, the scale of it, but we involve probably 500 reviewers uh, from both government uh, and academia and NGOs, and we, and we solicited detailed technical comments uh, on the entirety of the AR5, which I think is, is probably close to 5,000 uh, dense technical pages. Now, one of the interesting things about <coughs> the government review process, actually, actually not an encouraging thing, but as I mentioned, you know, the IPCC has 195 member nations, so in principle, 195 nations can submit review comments on these volumes. What the column on the right shows is that, in fact, the number of nations who actually submit comments is like 20 or 30, okay? Uh, a, a very small fraction. And, and, and it's actually worse than that, in fact, because of those 20 or 30, uh, I would say something like five submit a, a really substantial number of comments. And nobody, no other nation, comes close to the United States in, in terms of the, the, the comprehensiveness and the thoroughness of the review that, that we do. Um, and as the bottom line says, you know, the role of so-called review editors is to uh, be sort of an independent set of watchdogs who, who certify that the authors have considered each and every one of these 137,000 comments. Okay? And that's not to say that they have to adopt the suggestion, but they have to either adopt the suggestion or say, we're not doing this because, okay? So it's a very, very elaborate process, and it takes a long time, and I can tell you, I mean, it sure as hell is not the fastest way to write a report, okay? But that's not the point. The point, again, is to make the report authoritative, uh, and it does do that. Now, 
each of these volumes, I mentioned that each of these volumes is a phone book, okay, and they really are. I mean, the Working Group 1 uh, report, the physical printer report, weighs nine pounds, okay, it's just like, it's, it, there's a lot in there, okay. And because of that, each of these volumes has actually two summary documents, one of which is a 30 or 40 page summary for policymakers, and that is drafted by authors, but that is uh, finalized at these so-called approval sessions where delegates from uh, up to 195 countries come, and the process is we sit there for four or five days and we literally argue over every sentence in the 30, 40 page document. And, and the way the process works is it's a consensus based process, okay? So nothing gets in that summary that, every, that, that any nation objects to, okay? So any nation, uh, in order to be included, every sentence has to be approved by every nation, okay? And there's no process for overruling an objection. So if somebody objects to something, they have to be brought along, they have to be wheedled, they have to be persuaded. Uh, it's incredibly tedious, but again, uh, you, end up with, you end up with a summary document where you can say every, every nation has agreed to every sentence in this document. So it's a hideous process, but in the end it has value. And this, the, the, what the photo is showing is, uh, is how the process works. There's a bunch of delegates there, and there's the top bar is the, the, the top highlighted stuff is some proposed text, or, or, or I'm sorry, is, is, is the starting point, and then the, what's below there is somebody's proposed modification, and that's being developed, and this debated rather, and this process goes on and on and on. Um, so as I said, if agreement isn't reached, the, uh, the material is omitted, and I'll show you in working group three, in fact, uh, there was some important material where uh, argumentation went on for four or five days, no agreement was reached, and that stuff was actually omitted, I think, to the, to the detriment of the final product. The process is slow and painful. Well, what this slide is showing, this is working with one approval session in September. You, you, you probably can't read that, but the bar on the left is showing how much progress we've made through the, I think this, that summary for policy makers was 30 pages. So you can see we're about maybe a quarter of the way through it. The, the red bar on the right is showing the proportion of time that we've used. So we've used about two thirds of the available time, and we've gotten about a quarter of the way through. And that that happens every time. Okay, so there's this unfolding train wreck, uh, which takes a week to takes a week to occur. And the first couple of days, we work the United Nations schedule of six hours a day with a two-hour lunch and so on. And and this is the result. And then the last couple of days, we work 24/7. I mean, we literally sit there for 48 hours straight and argue about this stuff, and it just gets. It gets ridiculous. And this is the consequence. And I took this picture at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Literally, at 4 o'clock in the morning. You can see the Japanese delegation, the two members in front, and the one guy in the second row there are either checking their email very carefully or they're, or they're not. <laughs> uh, they actually not, they nod off. The US delegation or the rest of it, you can see. In the back left, there's a guy, a guy with a big black beard. That's Dave Reed Miller, an incredible guy. Um, Co Barrett and uh, Meredith Ryder Root. Co is from NOAA. Other two folks are from State Department. Actually, this is where we had the advantage, okay? Because we have a 13-hour time chain, so it felt like the middle of the afternoon to us. So we're relatively <laughs> wide awake. The home team is is, uh, is is catching a rest. Okay, so. That's all I want to say about the process. What I want to do now is, is, is actually go through each of Well, I actually will mention some, some more process I was doing, but what I thought I would do was just quickly go through each of the volumes and show you not everything, but stuff that I thought was sort of new and interesting. Oops. And, and, and I'll start with, so we'll start with uh, working group one, which again is the physical science stuff. And the thing that folks tend to focus on in these, and what I'm showing here is covers of successive reports, starting with the 1995 report, which was not the first one, it was the second one, but that was the first report that had some statement, any statement uh, uh, about what we call attribution of observed climate change to human influences, and you can read the words, and, and, and it's very interesting, actually, the 1995 report had this very, very weak statement, I mean, if you read the, word, the words there, it's, it has all kinds of qualifying language. Balance of evidence suggests discernible. So very weak, it's a very weakly worded statement, and yet it was, at the time, extremely controversial. And what I'm showing uh, over 
or to the right is comparable statements from subsequent assessment reports. And you can see the statement, and again, these are all statements about uh, assigning responsibility for observed climate change. And you can see that over the years and decades that the IPCC statements have become much more stronger, they've become much more quantitative, and uh, you can also see the IPCC has become much more verbose over the decades as well. And that's why I've had to use finer font as we progress. So that's one of the things that people focus on, uh, but there's a lot more uh, in these reports. And one of, the, one of the things that was got a lot of attention this time is this so-called equilibrium climate sensitivity. Equilibrium climate sensitivity is uh, a fairly fundamental physical quantity. Uh, it's commonly measured, at, it's commonly described as the change in global average temperature that would occur if one hypothetically doubled atmospheric CO2 from pre-industrial and then wait you know, a billion years for the system to equilibrate, how much warming would there be? And um, what was controversial or actually celebrated in the climate change denier uh, community is that in the fifth assessment report, they slightly change, they give a range every time, uh, and they slightly change, they slightly increased the lower bound on the range of equilibrium climate sensitivity. Why is that a big deal? It's actually not a big deal. I mean, equilibrium climate sensitivity is a big deal because all of the impacts and so on really scale with the equilibrium climate sensitivity. The higher that is, uh, the more severe the impacts will be. Uh, the fifth assessment report, uh, you can see reduced the, the lower bound estimate of equilibrium climate sensitivity from two degrees C to one and a half. And as I said, this was celebrated in some circles, but the fact is, if you read below, that actually that's just a return to previous historical estimates. And the fact is, uh, our knowledge of that quantity has really not evolved much over time uh, since, uh, since 1979, in fact. It's a difficult thing to estimate. Uh, nowadays, those estimates are based on, but there's various estimates. Some of them are based on instrumental observations. Some of them are based on paleo observations. Some of them are based on models. You know, it's it's pretty clearly well. It's somewhere in that range, which is a which is a pretty big range. Um, now, the the other the other thing that was controversial, or one of the other things that was controversial this time, the so-called warming hiatus. That term <coughs> refers to the fact that uh, in the last 15 years, really, the global average surface air temperature, not ocean temperatures, not sea level rise, not other measures of climate change but the global average surface air temperature, which a lot of folks tend to focus on, has actually increased very, very slowly. Okay? And again, this is something that the climate change in our community likes to point to and say climate change has stopped. That's not correct because, as I said, other indicators of climate change have, have kept going. And it's worth pointing out that, in fact, um, as, well, as you know, as a consequence of the greenhouse effect, the Earth is absorbing excess energy from space. That's the, really what the greenhouse effect is. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that only about 1% of that energy actually goes into the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is not a good place actually to look for global warming. About 90% or over 90% of the excess energy goes into the ocean. That's actually, if we, that's actually really the place to look for global warming. We focus on the atmosphere because we live there, okay? And because we have better observations, and that of course is also because we live there. So how did the IPCC treat this issue of the warming hiatus? I, I, I frankly think the treatment was not, and still is not, entirely satisfactory. I mean, and, and one of my unhappinesses with it is that this issue was treated in the second report dealing with the evaluation of climate models. And that, I think, is a fundamental mistake because it, what we understand about the physics of this recent slowdown in the warming is that it's due to two basic causes. Uh, one is uh, internal variability in the climate system, and it seems to be particularly, uh, for some reason, for the last 15 years, a, a, a greater amount of heat than normal, an even greater amount of heat than normal is going into the ocean, which has reduced the rate of atmospheric warming. That sort of internal variability is treated in climate models, but we know, well, the timing, no attempt in climate models is made to get the timing of that variability right. So uh, if that's the cause of, to the extent that that contributes to this so-called hiatus, we would not expect to see that in models 
at the same time we see it in observations. And, and in fact, we don't. We do see similar things at other times in model simulations. So it's not, it, look, you shouldn't expect to see it necessarily in models at the same time. The other, the other thing that we think contributes to the hiatus, uh, as this language says, is certain forces. Okay, 21st century volcanic eruptions, possibly uh, increases in Chinese aerosol emissions, certainly also some slight contribution from relatively low solar luminosity uh, recently. That's probably a small contribution. But again, none of those forcings, uh, well, almost in, 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 in very few of those model simulations are those forcings represented. The volcanic forcings in particular, which are probably the strongest, are not represented in any of the simulations for the simple reason that the simulations were performed before those eruptions occurred. Okay, so again, the point is, you would not expect to see the consequences of those forces in the simulation because they weren't put into the simulation. So it's not, you know, my point is that the hiatus is a genuine scientific puzzle to some extent, but it's not a good test of climate models and it shouldn't be in that section of IPCC. This language is actually not bad, and I will say that this is better, you know, this is one of the things I personally really fought for is to clarify some of the issues I just explained to you in condensed form uh, in that language. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, sea level rise projections are something else that is and were controversial. Uh, the IPCC, I think, has a bad reputation in terms of how it's treated sea level. Um, the, the projections for future sea level in this IPCC volume are higher than they were in the 2007 report. And the table at the top shows the results from the, the 2013 report. The, the, the chart on the bottom shows the result uh, from, uh, from the 2007 report. So the simulations, I'm sorry, the projections are higher. Um, a lot of folks felt that they weren't high enough. And these projections are based on so-called process-based models, which are models that include all the physics. And, and it, they're actually, it's interesting, that the sea level rise projections are actually pieced together in the sense that there's no one model that treats all of the processes. And by all the processes, I mean, I mean thermal expansion, I mean melting of glaciers, I mean melting of the massive land ice sheets. There's no single model that treats all of those pieces. Uh, and so these estimates are produced by estimating the different components using different models uh, and then adding them up. Uh, there's a different class of models called semi-empirical models, which are, as the name suggests, semi-empirical, and they're basically uh, based on his, historic relationships between sea level change and temperature change. That class of models, which was not at all used, which was completely rejected by the IPCC authors, produces much higher estimates of uh, sea level rise, up to twice as high as are, project, as are presented here. I think. Uh, it's true, well, my guess is that um, over subsequent projections of future sea level rise, my guess is will be higher than these. And uh, I would also suspect that the actual sea level rise will, will probably exceed these projections. The other thing I'll just point out before leaving is that, leaving this, is that the fourth assessment report and the fifth assessment report, if you just uh, do the most naive comparison of the sea level rise projections. They look very, very different. Uh, that is not quite an apples versus apples comparison, however, for various reasons of different scenarios, different start, starting points, different end dates. If you actually do a careful uh, apples and apples comparison, uh, the projections are, have increased, but not by as much as you would naively think from just looking at this. Um, so this is something else that's new and I think important, and this and this has come out. This is an, something that's emerged since the fourth assessment report, and that is that there is essentially a linear relationship between global temperature change and cumulative CO2 emissions. Okay, and that's a kind of a handy dandy uh, you know, way to estimate future climate change. It's not very optimistic, and that relationship is, is illustrated on the chart on the horizontal axis is cumulative uh, CO2 emissions since 1870, not quite pre-industrial, but more or less. And the vertical axis is globally average temperature change. So you can see there's a dashed line heading off from the two degree warming threshold. 
the, the sort of, well, the gray band below <coughs> is uh, a range of estimates from, uh, well, simulations, but also corroborated by observations of, of, of emissions of pure CO2, okay? The colored band of higher is based on emission scenarios where not only, there's other greenhouse gases besides CO2 emitted, and that's why those temperature changes are a bit higher. But so what this says is that uh, if you count for non-CO2 gases, in order to stay below 2 degrees of global average temperature change, uh, we're allowed something like 820 uh, gigatons of carbon cumulative emissions, and we've already emitted about two-thirds of that. Okay. Uh, and, and not all of the warning <coughs> from, those, from the 515 gigatons that we've emitted uh, has been realized. Okay. So we're most of the way uh, towards crossing this threshold that we think we don't want to cross. Um, the fifth assessment report has new stuff on how climate change affects various categories of extreme weather. I don't take the time to look at all of this. I, you know, it's actually it was actually interesting to me to go back. I mean, I think of the, I think of climate change and extreme weather as an area that's gotten a lot more attention recently. Uh, I was actually surprised to go back and look at previous assessment reports and see how much there actually is uh, in there on this subject. So this is not, I mean, it's an area that has re received a lot of attention, but uh, it's not an entirely new area, certainly. Okay, the second volume uh, is on impacts of adaptation and vulnerability, and again, this is how, this, this, this volume really discusses how all these changes in the physical climate system uh, affect things that we care about, and it also gets into institutional issues of adaptation and what can we do to try to minimize harm. Uh, from climate change. I think that there's some interesting new things in this version of this report compared to previous versions, and one is uh, the overall risk framing. And the overall risk framing is basically saying that, look, climate change increases risk of certain outcomes. And that's a way, a sort of a global way of, of looking at how climate change impacts your life. Uh, the other thing I think that's, one of the other things that I think that's interesting and new in this presentation is the, uh, the broadening of the focus to recognize that for most of these sorts of impacts like human health and water scarcity and so on and so on, uh, there's multiple stressors, right? Well, the, and these things are problems already absent climate change in many areas. Uh, climate change is an additional stressor that interacts with existing and, and in this report, more than previous ones, I think, uh, recognizes that fact. The, the other thing that I find particularly interesting in this report is the, and this is new, and, and that is the idea of trying to do what we call detection and attribution on climate change impacts. Okay? <coughs> detection and attribution has traditionally been limited to the physical science space, and what it is, it's essentially assigning causes to observe changes. Okay, so to take the simplest example, we see global average temperatures increasing. Uh, what's the cause of that? Okay, uh, and the science of detection and attribution uh, tries to rigorously partition, okay, how much of this warming is due to natural factors, how much is due to human greenhouse gases, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that, that and it's, very, it, it's very interesting, very challenging science. Again, that had traditionally been confined to the physical science space, uh, folks are now trying to assign causality to impact. So if we see species going extinct, for example, can we say why? Can we, can we address the question, how much of this is due to climate change? How much is this is due to other stressors? Okay. Very, very challenging science. I think it's actually more challenging in the impact space than in the physical science space. This line starts to get into that for the first time. Uh, it's very immature at this point, but I think it's one of the new Again, an interesting area. Um, I, I hate this figure, so I'm, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> And it, there's two versions of it in the report that I, I hit. Um, one of the other messages from this report, and this also came out, this message was underscored re more recently in the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which we released in May. Uh, and, and that is simply the message that we can document rigorously that impacts of climate change are happening now. Okay? And that probably doesn't seem like a big deal to folks 
like you who actually work in the field, but to the public, that's actually not only an important message, but in many cases, I think, uh, a new message. And, and, these, and these are some of the impacts that IPCC emphasizes. Um, this, uh, I forget where this came from, but this is, okay. Actually, it was, this is, the kind of, this is the kind of thing that's more funny at 4 o'clock in the morning than it is, than it is at 10.30 in the morning. Okay. Um, now, the IPCC also discusses future risk. Crop yields are something that folks are very interested in, and, and this got a lot of attention. Uh, the, the crop models project pretty significant losses uh, in crop yields just from climate, not considering uh, effects like pests. Uh, and this, this got a lot of attention uh, in the media. Uh, human health, uh, it, the, well, the IPCC statements on human health are relatively mild, I think also got some attention. Um, extreme weather risk, yeah. Something else that got up a lot of a lot of attention: species and species extinction. Um, again, the IPCC makes some fairly strong but very uh, well fairly qualitative uh, statements, which in many cases, well, you know, one of the, my personal frustrations with this volume uh, as a physical science guy, a lot of it, a lot of it ends up being fairly qualitative, and the problem is it's really difficult to make these high level general statements. It's much easier to make quantitative statements if you're focused on one specific geographical region where there happen to be good observations and so on. But if you want to get, if you want to um, generalize to global statements, uh, it, in many cases, in most cases, you simply it's simply not possible to make to make strong quantitative statements. This uh, this I like. This uh, I have to say. Well, this this figure is looking at the issue of how the species uh, respond to climate change, and, and the, it, it's a simple idea, and this idea uh, is based on a paper actually that a guy named Scott Worry at Stanford and I and a few others wrote in 2009, and, and the idea is this, okay, you can, think of, you can think of climate change or warming as a temperature increase, you can also think of it as a given a zone, of, a, given, a zone that's at a given temperature moves horizontally across the surface of the planet. Okay? So as the planet warms, you know, the 20 degree C isotherm moves toward the poles. Okay, uh, and how rapidly does that move in you know, kilometers per year? Okay, and what, what's interesting about that in terms of species is that if if you know the climate that a species likes is moving horizontally across the surface of the planet. Uh, one way or another, then to stay in the environment that it likes, that species has to move too. Okay, and some species can move very quickly. Some species can't move very quickly. And this slide, again, it's it's trying to lump a lot of things together. But this slide is looking at how rapidly species would need to move under various climate scenarios, and that's what's shown in the in the vertical axis and then how rapidly species physically can move. And again, you know, some species can move very quickly, others cannot. And the idea is that, of course, if, you know, if a species needs to move uh, to maintain a constant temperature, if it needs to move faster than it's physically capable of, then it has a problem. And, and it calls out flat areas and other areas because if you actually think about it, the horizontal uh, propagation of a line of constant temperature across the surface of the Earth is actually fastest in horizontal areas. It's actually faster than uh, in sloped areas. Okay. Um, there's a lot of stuff in this volume on human security, on poverty, on global conflict, actually global and sub-global conflict. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. This paragraph uh, is, believe it or not, the only section in the report that systematically, and in working with two, that systematically discusses, you know, what happens if we, if we don't meet the two degree threshold, if we get substantially above that. And this is something, frankly, I'm, I'm proud of. I, I am one guy from the British delegation, really lobbied. We got this in there. And uh, it's, it's language that's pulled up out of the underlying chapter. We didn't make it up. 
but we thought that it was important to have, to say something at least about what could happen at four degrees C uh, of global average temperature change. And, and the fact is we don't know very precisely what, what could happen, but uh, it, it, we thought it was important to have some language uh, in there. So let me turn now to so-called working group three, okay? And again, this is mostly climate change economics. Uh, it's mitigation pathways and all of that good stuff. And this, this meeting was, it doesn't like this, I'm gonna stay on the slide. This, this uh, approval session took place in Berlin. Uh, and I will say this was of the four of these things that I've done so far. I'm gonna do another one again uh, in two weeks. This was by far, the most contentious, the most controversial. I remember walking in there on the first day, seeing this giant delegation from Saudi Arabia, you know, headed by their head UNFCCC negotiator, and I felt like the 98-pound weakling, you know, taking the field and again looking at these 300-pound monsters who were about to claw me, uh, and thinking, you know, what, what in the hell am I doing here? You know, uh, it didn't actually turn out that way, uh, but, but it was an interesting experience. And this. This sculpture here happened to be in Berlin, where we were, and I, and I, I wish we had projected it on the screen uh, during the, the discussion. Anyway, I felt like I'm one of these guys in this picture. Um, so, the, you know, the main thing that I got out of, and this working group three, and all this uh, mitigation technology and climate change economics was a relatively new area, and it still is a relatively new area. The big thing that I got out of this was that uh, it will be exceedingly difficult, not impossible, but exceedingly difficult to meet the, this commonly cited target of keeping global average temperature change to within two degrees of pre-industrial. If we wait another 10 or 15 years, it will be impossible, I think. And, and the stark message is that in order to meet that uh, target, what would we have to do? Uh, by the middle of this century, we would have to cut global greenhouse gas emissions essentially in half. The range is 40 to 70 percent lower than 2010. Uh, and, well, we would have to cut them in half from where they are now. We would have to cut them by more than half from where they are projected to be absent climate policy uh, in 2050. Uh, by 2100, uh, global CO2 emissions need to be essentially zero, maybe even less than zero. And, um, one of the other things that emerges in this report is that uh, is so-called carbon dioxide removal, they, and that refers to the idea of actually pulling CO2, unemitting carbon fuel, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. And a lot of the scenarios in this report make use of what I would call massive, large-scale carbon dioxide removal. Um, removal right? okay? And the, the problem is we actually don't know how to do that. Okay? We know how to do it, but we don't know how to do it at massive scale. So there's a little bit of magic going on here. Uh, actually, a lot of magic. Um, whoops, that is a working group one slide. Okay. Um, so one of the just to, to start walking you through some of the interesting results: global greenhouse gas emissions have accelerated. U.S. emissions have not. Uh, this shows the continued progression of global greenhouse gas emissions. You can see a little hiccup. Uh, due to the recession, but that trend has, that downward trend has been reversed. This is slide is based on the so-called Kaya identity, and this tells you, it compares emissions decade to decade, and it, it tells you why have emissions gone up. And if you look at the bar on the right, for example, it tells you that the biggest contributor to the increased emissions in 20, 2001 to 2010 compared to the previous decade, the biggest contributor to that increase in emissions is the dark blue bar, which represents per capita GDP. Okay, so in other words, uh, the biggest contributor to increased emissions in the last two decades has been increases in individual wealth, okay, which is in many ways a good thing, but it does tend to increase CO2 emissions. Uh, the yellow wedge there, or square there below the zero line indicates that energy intensity of GDP, in other words, the amount of energy that humanity uses <coughs> for, uh, you know, a dollar of economic output has actually decreased. And that is a factor that has tended to actually 
it has tended to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, but it hasn't been enough to overcome the other factors. The other thing that's interesting here is the, the top little wedge on the right-hand bar in, the, in a sort of an orangey reddy color is represents the carbon intensity of uh, energy. Okay, uh, how much the proportion of energy that or the amount of actually CO2 emitted per unit of energy generated. That, uh, in the, you can see in the previous bar, that was below the zero line, meaning that that had decreased. Uh, and in the most recent uh, comparison, it actually increased. And that is due to heavier use of coal uh, in some parts of the world. So that's, that's actually a bad trend. Uh, now this, oops, this, is a, this was one of the controversial slides. Figures actually, I should say, in the third seven report. And this was actually omitted. This was originally supposed to be in the summary for policy measures. It was omitted. It was omitted because it, it was, certain nations objected to it. And what does this show? It shows actually two things. It shows uh, greenhouse gas emissions, not by individual countries, but by groups of countries. And there's uh, the countries are grouped into four categories according to income levels. Uh, and uh, the top blue sort of wedge there is emissions from uh, the wealthiest countries, uh, and the, uh, the, the next one down, the, the brightest yellow color, is from upper middle income countries, and that includes China. And you know, the big message from this slide is that the traditional picture of the wealthiest nations, or anyway, the you know the the U.S. and the European nations being responsible for the great majority of not only current emissions but cumulative emissions, that's really changing very, very rapidly. And the so-called upper middle income countries, you can see their emissions are increasing very, very rapidly. And that's, I, I assume, mostly due to China. Um, and, and that's, a, frankly, a picture that some folks uh, <laughs> That's a story that some folks did not want to see emphasized. So, so this slide was not included in the summary for policymakers. Of course, it is in the underlying volume. I guess the assumption is that no one in their right mind would open that, you know, 1,500-page phone book and, and start and start thumbing through. Oh, the, the other thing that's interesting here is that there's actually each of these uh, groups of countries. There are two curves, okay, and the two curves represent so-called consumption-based emissions and so-called territory-based emissions. Territory-based emissions is what, a more traditional way of assigning emissions, and that is, you know, if the smokestack is in your country, then you assign those emissions. Okay, uh, consumption-based emissions is another way of looking at things, and that is, and, and that's specifically based on the idea that certain nations, China, in fact, uh, some amount of their CO2 emissions uh, uh, occur in the process of manufacturing stuff that they then. Uh, export to us, okay? And so in the consumption-based emissions way of looking at things, those emissions are assigned to us, not to China, even though they physically occur in China. And, and, and showing things this way and that way was also very controversial. Another way you can show emissions is per capita. Uh, you can show sort of emissions per capita. And, you know, this is extremely contentious, and different countries argue for presenting the emissions in different ways, and, and somehow, coincidentally, they all argue for uh, presenting the emissions in ways that make them look good and make other people look bad. Uh, to, to our credit, the United States consistently argues for, but we will, let's show everything, okay? We'll show per capita, we'll show consumption base, we'll show territory base, let's just put it all out there and, 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 not, and not make these choices. Um, okay. so, one of the other interesting things is that this, all of the stuff in this volume, uh, working group three, is, is based on a whole different set of models. You know, this, the, the working group one report, the physical climate science stuff that I showed you earlier, is based on these on global climate models. Uh, as I said at the outset, the stuff in this working group is all based on these so-called integrated assessment models, which are primarily economic models with a little bit of physics and carbon cycle added. Uh, and the, this volume was based on an analysis of, of almost something like a thousand uh, simulations run with a pretty big set of these models. And, and one of the things that was interesting and a little bit surprising to me, and, and you know, to me this is this table, although it's a mess, and you should see the caption for it. I mean, the caption is like half a page of three-point font. Uh, 
you know, uh, about a million words. But there's actually, if you take the time to p pick it apart, there's actually some interesting stuff here. What I've outlined, what I've emphasized here is the lower, uh, the lowest row, which shows uh, so-called baseline scenarios. That is scenarios that assume no climate policy, really. And I've got two arrows pointing at uh, one column there, which shows global average temperature change. And one thing that's interesting is that this volume, Working Group 3, has some numbers for global average temperature change. You can see the, up, the highest number there is 7.8 degrees C, which is not only shockingly high, but it's much higher than any number mentioned in Working Group 1, even though the scenarios are approximately consistent. These baseline scenarios are approximately consistent with one of the scenarios used in Working Group 1. So why are the numbers so much higher? And uh, it was puzzling to me at first. If you pick it apart, OK, and this is actually showing that comparison. Okay, So the top table there is from Working Group 1. You can see for the highest number mentioned is a global average temperature change of 4.8 degree C, you can see working group three, 7.8, big difference, like huge difference, huge. But where is that different to come from? If you pick it apart, as I said, these factors are listed there. Different reporting periods, okay? Different starting periods, different ending period. That makes a different difference. Um, there's different models uh, make a small difference. Uh, working group three, gets a bigger range because they use a lot more simulations, a lot more models. Working Group 1 uses 30 or 35 models. Working Group 3, as I mentioned, there's 900 scenarios, so you, you fill out the range more. The other, the other thing, and I think the biggest contributor to the higher possible values in Working Group 3 is that actually, surprisingly, and, and perhaps, well, surprisingly, Working Group 3 actually does a more systematic job of exploring uh, the climate science uncertainty, which may seem surprising, right? I mean, you would think that should be done in work group one, but the fact is this, okay, and this is one of the limitations of the approach we use now for looking at future climate, really. It, what we do is we take results from models, as I said, work group one has 30 or 35 models, okay, and we sort of lump them all together, and, we, and I showed you a bunch of these plots where we sort of have a big, sort of smooth uh, swath which represents the range of model results, okay? And we typically, or sometimes, make the mistake of thinking that that's an, uncert or an uncertainty balance, okay? And it really isn't, okay? And the reason, well, one of the reasons it really is, there's a number of reasons why it really isn't, but one of the reasons why it really isn't is that every one of those models is trying to make a central estimate, okay? Every one of those models is trying to make, get the most likely estimate of future climate, okay? None of those models is looking at, none of those models has gone through the exercise of varying parameter values, for example, and exploring the range, okay? So when you actually just take a range of 35 models and, and kind of draw, uh, you know, draw a swath, what you're not really looking at the full uncertainty range. You're looking at the range of central estimates across a bunch of models. And what Working Group 3 has done is they have gone through the exercise of systematically, they have simpler models, so they have gone through this exercise of systematically varying the values of lots of parameters within the model, and lo and behold, you get a much bigger range. Okay, so I've, I've taken a lot of time to explain that, but it's, it's actually shocking that uh, we focus so much on these numbers, and yet these, these seemingly little things can make rather big differences in what we're doing. Okay, question about that before you go off that slide, though. I'm sorry. On that previous slide where you're talking about adding the uncertainty, but why is it stretching it only up and not I don't down? know. I'm not sure the answer to that, except I think it fundamentally is, I, I think it, it, it comes from this property, which is that the uncertainty in the uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity, which I described earlier, is very, very highly skewed, and it's highly skewed towards higher uh, possible values rather than, it's very, very asymmetric. I think, I think that's the fundamental reason uh, behind that. Okay, so here, th this, is, this is the basis of the statement I made earlier. I'm showing you here, uh, I'm emphasizing one set of scenarios which are likely to meet, uh, likely to meet the two degree target. And, and I said earlier that essentially to 
To do this, we would have to reduce emissions compared to 2010 emissions, reduce emissions by about 50% uh, in 2050, and that is shown in one of the columns, the columns in a very obscure way. Uh, the column that says minus 72 to minus 41. That's saying that in order to do this, we would have, by 2050, we would have to reduce emissions relative to 2010 by 41 to 70 percent. And you can see the column under 2100 says that we, we would have to reduce emissions by anywhere from 78 percent to 118 percent. So obviously, reducing emissions by 118 percent would make them less than zero. And this, again, is this uh, the invocation of carbon dioxide as mobile that I mentioned earlier. Okay, we're almost done. I want to talk about economic costs of climate change. This is, uh, it, it can be a controversial area. It's also, I think, a murky area. And, but just to open the discussion, costs of climate change can be grouped into three categories. The impacts costs are, you know, if climate change causes human health impacts, causes excess morbidity and mortality, you can assign an economic cost to that. Uh, adaptation costs, if we adopt measures to uh, reduce uh, those sorts of impacts, uh, one can, in principle, assign a cost to those, although it's pretty difficult to do. Mitigation costs are costs to, that are investments that we make not to reduce future impacts of climate change, but to reduce future climate change itself, okay? So costs associated with climate change can be lumped into these three categories. Uh, and, and, and people talk about trading off uh, costs in one category versus another, and that's true, we do do that, but in general, we are paying and will continue to pay costs in all three of these categories. The question is, what will the balance be, right? Um, and and it, assigning or estimating what these costs are is very, very difficult. Uh, the IPCC does present an estimate of uh, costs of impacts to date. Uh, it has just an incredible paragraph of uh, caveating language, which, well, you can read some of the words here, incomplete, depending on a large number of assumptions, many of which are questionable, do not account for catastrophic changes, tipping points, and many other factors, blah, 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 blah. So uh, they basically come right out and tell you we really don't have a clue about how to estimate this category of costs. Uh, mitigation costs are interesting, and this is another one of these horrible tables from working three with you know, another footnote that's on, you know, a mile long and three point font. Um, and, and this presents estimates of mitigation costs, uh, which I'll talk to you in a minute, and then the, so the sets of columns over to the right, those under the orange and those under the blue, look at the sensitivity of those costs to one of two things. One is delay, and the other is restrictions in available technology. Okay? So if we delay emitting by 20, if we do delay mitigation rather by 20 years or whatever, how much does that change cost? Or if we decide for whatever reason that we're not going to build any more nuclear power plants, how much does that affect cost? Okay, so it's looking at those sort of sensitivities. The columns more over to the left look at baseline cost. And the interesting thing about costs, baseline costs and mitigation, okay, the interesting thing about costs and mitigation is I really feel that the impression you get uh, is that a big cost or not a big cost? It really depends on how you look at it. Okay, and I, I've circled, uh, I've circled two boxes there. Okay, and the leftmost box that I circled says that by 2100, uh, and this is and this is for scenarios that are likely to meet the two degree target. Okay, this is presumably what we want to do. Okay, what this says is that. The cost of mitigation, according to these models, the central estimate is 4.8% of global consumption. 4.8% okay? sounds like a lot, right? But uh, remember this, okay? This is in, this is by 2100, and this is in relative to scenarios where the global economy is assumed to grow by anywhere from 300% to 900%, okay? So what this is saying is that instead of growing by 300% uh, by 2100, the global economy would grow by only 286%, okay, if you believe it, okay. So that sounds not so bad. Uh, or another way to think of that is that if, you know, if the economy grows at the canonical 3% per year, okay, then uh, a cost of 4.8% means a delay of one or two years. Okay, so that what that would say is that 
in order to achieve uh, the degree of wealth that you would otherwise achieve in 2100. If we mitigate, you won't get there until 2101 or 2102. Okay, we're sitting on that bet. Right? Another way to think of it is in terms of the annualized impact on growth rate, and that's the green column, which I've highlighted. And that says that the central estimate is 0 0.06 percentage points of growth. Okay, so what does that mean? So what that means is that if in the baseline scenario without mitigation, if the economy again were to grow at this canonical 3% per year, if we mitigate, instead of growing at 3% per year, it will grow at it would grow at 2.94% per year, which again doesn't seem so bad, but it does accumulate over decades to something actually significant. Um, so uh, we were of course very interested in how the media treated the press coverage. Um, it, it's tempting to try to compare. Uh, it's tempting to try to compare costs of mitigation and costs of adaptation uh, and costs of, of uh, impacts. Uh, it's really, I think, pretty much impossible uh, at this point to do it. The IPCC has estimates, and I've just shown you some of the caveat and language on the, est on the estimates of impact costs. Uh, nobody has a clue about adaptation costs, and I've already just got through describing mitigation costs. It's very difficult to cross-compare uh, the <coughs> different categories of costs at this point. Um, there was an interesting and controversial statement by Bjorn Longboard after working group three. He said, if we don't do anything, the damages caused by climate change will cost less than 2% of GDP in about 2070. The cost of doing something will likely be higher than 6% of GDP, and so the implication was, well, it's cheaper just to let climate change happen and deal with it. Uh, there's a lot that's wrong with that statement. First of all, as I showed you, the, six, the figure of 6% is higher, actually, just a misquotation of IPCC, but the biggest problem is that the, the cost of the 2% the figure for cost of impacts is not assuming we do no mitigation. That's actually in a scenario that's likely to meet the two-degree target. Okay. So that's what we'll pay even if we do very, very aggressive mitigation. So that is not an alternative to mitigation. That's in addition to the cost of mitigation, we will pay that 2%, okay? So we really will pay both of these costs. It's not, it's not an either or thing, okay? Uh, I think I'm almost done. We've been very patient. Okay, so this one, I was very happy. This is after working group three, which as I mentioned, was a very, very controversial uh, and difficult set of discussions. One of the lead authors, David Victor, appeared on the PBS News Arrow and said, I was pretty impressed by the US delegation. For the most part, they allowed the science to speak. And that, and that is really what we, what we tried to do. So thanks for listening. That was a very long talk, I'm sorry. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions.